Welcome to this training session from Aerohive covering 802.11 in basics. In this session we're going to cover physical enhancements including multiple input multiple output or MIMO, spatial multiplexing, maximum radio combining, channel bonding, and transmit beamforming. We're also going to cover MAC enhancements which include AM PDUs and AM SDUs. MIMO, multiple input, multiple output, uses multipath, whereas single input, single output, or CISO networks created a situation where MIMO will solve problems, but CISO would encounter the problems from the multipath. MIMO systems, as used by 802.11, and 802.11n radios are not really tied to 802.11n specifically. MIMO can exist outside of 802.11n but is a requirement for 802.11n. Single input, single output radios would deal with multipath by using antenna diversity to mitigate it. However, both antennas were never used simultaneously. With MIMO, there are multiple radio chains. The multiple radio chains are a combination of radio and antenna and those radio antenna can be used at the same time to create up fade rather than down fade as a result of the multipath. A MIMO radio is capable of transmitting up to four unique data streams within the multiple RF signals. Each data stream is capable of sending up to 72.2 megabits of real raw data. A MIMO radio will transmit multiple signals within different modulated data via each transmit antenna. In legacy 802.11 environments, multipath truly caused problems. It was mitigated by using antenna diversity. In MIMO, a signal that is reflected will arrive slightly out of sequence with the main beam signal just like in CISO, except in MIMO, the reflected signal or multipath is going to be used to increase the signal by causing upfade rather than downfade because of the use of the multiple antenna chains. In a typical indoor environment, multiple RF signals sent by a MIMO radio are going to take multiple paths to reach the MIMO receivers due to reflection from desktops and walls and filing cabinets and elevator shafts. For example, multiple copies of three original signals can be transmitted by multiple antennas. The MIMO receiver will then use advanced digital processing to sort out the originally transmitted signals. A high multipath environment actually helps a MIMO receiver differentiate between the unique data streams carried on the multiple RF signals. If multiple signals are sent by a MIMO transmitter, all arrive simultaneously at the receiver. The signals will cancel each other out and performance is basically the same as a non-MIMO system. But arriving at different times, you can use the difference, difference between the signals to in, differentiate which signal was transmitted from which radio. The receiving device, when it acknowledges the frame, can then tell the transmitting device how to time the signals from each radio so that the signals arrive in phase with each other, creating up phase on the next transmission. Radio chains. Conventional 802.11 radios transmit and receive RF signals by using just a single input, single output system. Single input, single output systems use a single radio chain. A radio chain is defined by a single radio and all of its supporting architecture, including any amplifiers or any type of attenuators or connectors any kind of converters, anything that is part of that system would be considered part of the SISO system. A MIMO system consists of multiple radio chains, each with 
a radio chain having its own antenna. A MIMO system is also characterized by the number of transmitters and receivers used by the multiple radio change. For example, a 2x3 MIMO system would consist of three radio chains with two transmitters and three receivers. A 3x3 MIMO system would use three radio chains with three transmitters and three receivers. In a MIMO system, the first number always references the transmitters, the second number represents the receivers. And if there's a third number, such as 3x3x3 MIMO, the third number represents the number of data streams. Spatial multiplexing. Within the multiple transmissions is independent unique data stream. Each independent data stream is known as a spatial stream and each unique stream can contain different data than the other streams. Each stream will also travel in a different path because there is at least a half wavelength of space between the multiple transmitting antennas. The fact that the uh, multiple streams follow different paths to the receiver is because of the space between the transmitting antennas known as spatial diversity. When sending multiple independent streams of unique data using spatial diversity, it is also often referred to as a spatial multiplexing or spatial diversity multiplexing system, which is used by 802.11n. Spatial multiplexing has several benefits. The benefit of, of transmitting this way, the largest benefit, is the unique data streams uh, that are pushed through are drastically increasing the throughput. If a MIMO access point sends two unique data streams to a MIMO client station that receives both streams, the throughput is effectively doubled. If a MIMO access point sends three unique data streams to a MIMO client station that receives all three streams, the throughput is effectively tripled. It is possible to have an access point that supports 3x3x3 three by three by three MIMO, but maybe there's a client connecting, such as a phone, that only supports 1x1x1. One by one by one. If that is the case, the access point can step down to communicate with the less efficient client. Radio chains and spatial streams. A 2x3 MIMO system would consist of three radio chains with two transmitters and three receivers. A 3x3 MIMO system will consist of three radio chains with three transmitters and three receivers. In a MIMO system, the first number always references the transmitters, the second number references the receivers, and the third number references the spatial streams. Please don't confuse the independent unique streams of data with the number of transmitters. In fact, when referring to MIMO radios, it is important to also reference how many unique streams of data are sent and received by the MIMO radios. Most Wi-Fi vendors, using a three-number syntax when describing MIMO radio capabilities, are going to show you 3x3 three three or 2x3 three and a third number separated by a colon to represent the number of spatial streams. In a MIMO system, the first number always is the transmitter, the second number is always the receiver, and again the third number represents how many unique streams of data can be sent or received. For example, 3x3x2 three by three by would use three transmitters and three receivers, however only two unique data streams are ever utilized. Another example of 3x3x3 three by three by three would mean that there are three transmit, three receive, and three spatial streams. MIMO diversity. MIMO diversity uses maximal ratio combining, uses algorithms to join multiple received signals, and is going to function much better indoors than outdoors. 
The reason this functions better indoors than outdoors is because indoors there are more reflections that the MIMO diversity can be used for to determine the different signal streams and create upfade. When using this outdoors, there are not as many surfaces to reflect off of, so there are not as many reflections for MIMO to use to improve the signal strength. Antenna diversity. Antenna diversity is simply a method of mitigating the effects of multipath as opposed to utilizing multipath. Legacy 802.11n radios, such as uh, pre-N or maybe uh, legacy ABG radios, use single input, single output, and would use two antenna connected to one radio. However, unlike a MIMO chain, the two antenna could not be used at the same time, and the antenna on the receiving device would be the antenna that picks up the stronger signal strength being used, the weaker signal being picked up by the second antenna would be ignored. When that device responded by sending an acknowledgement, it would transmit back out the antenna that received the signal strength greater than the other because that antenna would be more likely to transmit back to the client that uh, they're trying to get to in a stronger manner. Receive diversity versus transmit diversity. When I'm receiving, I have the ability to transmit uh, data from one client to another and the receiving client will decide which antenna is going to be used for the reception based on signal strength. When I transmit, I'm going to transmit back out that same antenna. 802.11n devices are using methods that create upfade such as maximum ratio combining, space-time block coding, and cyclic shift diversity. Maximal ratio combining. Without maximal ratio combining, one signal sent is only going to be received through one antenna. This is a case for a single input, single output environment using simple antenna diversity. By using maximal ratio combining, one or more signals can be sent. All signals are going to be received and combined at the receiver, increasing the fidelity of the signal. The receiver also has multiple radio chains. When received diversity is used, the antenna may also be linearly combined by using a signal processing technique, which we call maximal ratio combining. Algorithms are used to combine multiple received signals by looking at each unique signal and optimally combining the signals in a method that is additive rather than destructive in, as in CISO. MIMO systems using both switch diversity and maximal ratio combining together will effectively raise the signal to noise level of the received signal. Maximal ratio combining is most useful when a non-MIMO radio transmits to a MIMO receiver and multipath occurs. The maximal ratio combining algorithm focuses on the signal with the highest signal to noise ratio level. However, it may still combine information from the noisier signals. The end result is that you have less data corruption occurring because a better estimate of the original signal has been reconstructed by comparing the stronger signal with some of the weaker signals that are received. Space time block coding. Space time block coding is simply a method where the same information is transmitted on two or more antennas. It is a type of transmit diversity. By sending multiple copies of the same signal on multiple antennas, the actual rate of the data transmitted does not increase as you add more antennas. The rate does, however, increase the receiver's ability to detect signals at a lower signal-to-noise ratio than would otherwise have been possible. The received sensitivity of the radio system improves, space-time block coding and cyclic shift diversity are transmit diversity techniques 
where the same transmit data is sent out of multiple antennas. Space-time block coding communication is possible only between 802.11n devices. Cyclic shift diversity signals can be received by either 802.11n capable devices or by legacy 802.11 devices. Channel bonding. With 40 megahertz versus 20 megahertz channels, you're going to get a much greater throughput. By using channel bonding with 802.11n, data frames are sent on 40 megahertz wide channels, and the unbonded channels, the 20 megahertz channels, would be reserved for management frames. Maximizing throughput in 2.4 may mean that you do not want to bond channels. In 2.4 gigahertz, the channels overlap with each other. If I were going to bond channels in 2.4, I would have to bond non-overlapping channels, so I might possibly bond channel 1 and channel 6, which could mean that I'm only able to co-locate one access point using channel bonding in a physical area, because there would only be one single 20 megahertz channel left over and I would not be able to bond that with anything else. In 2.4, you can maximize throughput actually by not channel bonding and co-locating more APs in the same area, breaking up the contention domain. Bonding in 5 gigahertz actually let you, lets you create a situation where you're using non-overlapping channels, and I can get 40 megahertz wide channels by using the four channels in Uni1 as depicted in this image, you can bond channels 36 and 40 and 40 and 48 together so I could put two APs in the same airspace using channel bonding. If I were in the upper Uni band, I could also add two APs. By using both the upper and lower Uni bands, I have the ability to put four access points in the same area that are using channel bonding. If you're in a high density environment, you may elect to do the same thinking as in 2.4 and not bond in order to break up the collision domains resulting in the ability to co-locate eight access points and instead of co-locating only four. Here's an example of channel bonding in 5 gigahertz versus channel bonding in 2.4. The top illustration is bonding the channels in the lower uniband the bottom example is bonding in 2.4's ISM bands. Notice that if you bond in 2.4, you really can only put one access point there because you're taking up almost all of the 2.4 space and you only have one single channel left. Legacy signaling. 802.11n introduced transmit beam forming as part of its requirements. Transmit beam forming allows the receiving client to help the transmitter communicate better with it the next time it sends a signal. Without transmit beam forming, reflections are going to continue to cause problems even with antenna diversity. You may have signals arriving out of phase and have problems because of the delay spread between the signals, you're not able to communicate back to the client anything saying, hey, next time you transmit to me, transmit your radios closer together or farther apart in terms of when they transmit. And you're going to wind up with the same problem we've always had requiring some type of mitigation. With 802.11n using transmit beam forming, it uses phase adjustment. Transmit beamforming can be used when there are more transmitting antennas than there are spatial data streams. This beamforming is a method that allows a MIMO transmitter using multiple antennas to adjust the phase of the outgoing transmissions in a coordinated method. When multiple copies of the same signal are sent to a receiver, the signals will usually arrive out of phase with each other. If the transmitter knows about the receiver's location, the phase of the multiple signals sent by a MIMO transmitter can be adjusted. When the multiple signals arrive at the receiver, they are now in phase with each other, 
resulting in constructive multipath creating up fade rather than creating down fade and a degradation of the signal. Carefully controlling the phase of the signals transmitted from multiple antennas has the effect of emulating a high gain unidirectional antenna. Because transmit beamforming results in constructive multipath communications, the result is a higher signal to noise ratio and a greater received signal strength or amplitude. Therefore, transmit beamforming will re result in greater range for individual clients communicating with an access point. Transmit beamforming will also result in higher throughput because of the higher signal to noise ratio that allows for the use of more complex modulation methods that can encode more data bits. The higher the signal to noise ratio also results in fewer layer 2 retransmissions due to collisions with noise. Frame aggregation. 802.11n also introduces methods of frame aggregation which is a method of combining multiple frames into a single frame transmission. The fixed MAC layer overhead is going to be reduced because I don't have to transmit multiple frames to get the same volume of data through. The odds of con collision are lower because I'm transmitting fewer frames and the overhead caused by a random back off timer doing, during any type of medium contention will also be minimized because I'm not transmitting as many frames. Much like driving in a carpool reduces the amount of traffic on the road. Frame aggregation. An aggregate MAC service data unit or aggregate MSDU is part of how 802.11n works. 802.11n access point using an, M an AS, AMSDU aggregation will receive multiple 802.11n frames. Remove any kind of weird headers from 802.3 and any trailers and instead of having separate headers and trailers from the 802.3 frame that's passed down for transmission wirelessly it's going to wrap the multiple MSDU payloads into a single 802.11 frame for transmission. The aggregated MSDUs will have a single destination when wrapped together in a single frame. The entire frame can then be encrypted using either TKIP or CCMP and if you want to get the higher data rates using 802.11n you will need to be using CCMP. Uh, it is important to note that the individual MSDUs must all be of the same 802.11e quality of service category. You cannot mix voice and data or best effort together. They all must be of the same category in order for this aggregation to work. Aggregating a MAC protocol data unit. Remember the MAC protocol data unit is an entire 802.11 frame including the MAC header, the body, and the trailer. Individual MPDUs within an AMPDU must all have the same receiver address. Also, the data payload of each MPDU is encrypted separately by using either TKIP or CCMP. Very much like an MSDU aggregation, individual MPDUs must all be of the same 802.11e quality of service access category. Again, you cannot mix voice and data or best effort and data. Everything's got to be of the same type in order to be aggregated. MPDU aggrega aggregation has more overhead than MSDU aggregation because each MPDU has an individual MAC header and trailer. However, cyclical redundancy check errors can be detected in the individual MPDU frames and therefore an entire MPDU does not need to be retransmitted only the individual MPDU that is corrupted along the way would need to be transmitted. Therefore when using aggregate MPDUs you have a situation where you are less susceptible to noise than an MSDU. 
the majority of vendors use aggregate MPDUs in current equipment available in the market today. Just like we can bind together the data for transmission, you can also bind together the acknowledgments. In this case, it would be called block acknowledgments. An 802.11 unicast frame has to be followed by an acknowledgment for verification purposes because you cannot detect wireless collisions. Multicast and broadcast frames do not have to be acknowledged. An MSDU contains multiple uh, aggregations when, when using this type of transmission. Every MSDU is all wrapped together in a single frame with only one MAC header and only one destination. Therefore, only normal acknowledgments are required when using MSDU aggregation. However, an aggregate MPDU contains multiple MPDUs, each with their own unique MAC header, just like we previously discussed, so that if one piece of it becomes corrupt, you only have to transmit that one piece again. However, each of the MPDUs, in this case, must be acknowledged separately. This can be accomplished by using block acknowledgments. It's called a multiple traffic ID block acknowledgement or MTBA frame. An MTBA frame is essentially a block act frame for an AMPDU. Using a single acknowledgement for multiple frame aggregations reduces the overhead at layer two and improves throughput because each piece is going to be acknowledged as a part of a block acknowledgement just like each piece was transmitted as part of a block transmission. That reduces contention and reduces the amount of time any one piece of traffic has to be in the air. Some notes about block acknowledgements. Block acknowledgements are, are used as list of data frames being acknowledged. Block acknowledgements provide a more efficient means of frame acknowledgement and block acknowledgments allow selective retransmission of data frames if needed. Backhaul speeds. 802.11n really changed the game for Wi-Fi. The bottleneck has traditionally been thought of as the speed of Wi-Fi on the network because you could plug in and get a 100 megabit Ethernet connection. Why in the world would I want to plug, use Wi-Fi and only get a 54 megabit data rate resulting about an 18 and a half or 20 megabit throughput. With 802.11n's more efficient modulation techniques and MIMO and channel bonding, you can get data rates theoretically of up to 600 megabits. Practically, with today's hardware, you're going to get data rates of somewhere around 200 megabits as the throughput. In this case, standard Ethernet is the bottleneck, not the Wi-Fi. So when deploying 802.11n, one might find themselves replacing cable and switches on the infrastructure side in order to support the wireless devices. Some common devices you'll find in the market today using 802.11n include phones and laptops and tablets. And here are some popular ones from Apple. Uh, the phones are still one by one by one MIMO, as are the iPads. That's to save battery life in the device using single radio chains. Phones are still 2.4 gigahertz to be backwards compatible with most networks and to save battery life. Whereas the iPads can do both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz from the iPad 2 and up. MacBooks can be of a newer variety or a legacy MacBook. Older MacBooks use 3 by 3 by 2 MIMO and use 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Newer MacBooks use 3 by 3 by 3 MIMO and can do 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. Some devices, not inside Apple specifically, but some devices may support multiple spatial and data streams like this, but they may not support channel bonding. If you look to the right of this chart, you'll see even from the single vendor, some of the devices support channel bonding and some do not. So there is no guarantee that even if the access point supports every feature that's possible in N to the maximum of that feature's capability, that there will be clients in the next network that can support that as well. When deploying Wi-Fi, 
always remember that you are deploying to support the clients, not to support every feature that can be turned on in the access point. Thank you for viewing this session from Arrowhive covering 802.11 in basics. Please continue the rest of the series at your earliest convenience.